Uh, please join me in welcoming on the stage Ambassador Tony Wayne and uh, Dr. Rafael Fernandez de Castro. Uh, I'll sit here and sit there, please. Bruce Jones already introduced uh, our very distinguished uh, panelist in his remarks because of uh, time and wanting to make sure that uh, the audience has enough chance to ask questions. I will not repeat uh, the introductions of our two stars uh, who are uh, very um, uh, prominent in uh, fostering U.S.-Mexican uh, security cooperation and much broader U.S.-Mexican cooperation over many decades. I only want to um, reiterate what uh, Bruce had said in his opening remarks, namely that uh, Rafael chaired a uh, task force that produced a white paper on uh, how uh, security cooperation could, should proceed in the era of the Trump administration and the Lopez Obrador administration. It was a bilateral task force uh, that including uh, distinguished experts and high government officials from Mexico and the United States, and among the distinguished stars was Ambassador Wayne. And um, I would, uh, the paper was available when you entered, um, and I would be very delighted if you could share with us some of the key um, findings and recommendations. Rafael. Thank you, Wanda. Let me do up. I prefer to, to, to speak from, from the podium. And uh, but, uh, even though uh, Ambassador has left, I, I just wanted to, uh, to make sure that I, I mean, that we recognize that uh, she accepted our invitation. She's an academic, uh, and, and she's a diplomat very close to academics. She was uh, at a point in, in her life a wonderful professor of international relations, and, uh, and I can tell that she continues to be uh, close to academics, to policy ideas, so, so I want to thank her for being here. Uh, first of all, Banda, I also want to recognize you. You're a wonderful team player. Uh, you're so efficient, so, I mean, you're wonderful in organizing organizing these events. Uh, you know, if, if I, I will nominate you to become uh, part of the L3, that is the Mexican soccer team, we badly need people like you, Van. <laughs> we, we definitely need people like you. And I want to recognize some people from the task force who are here. First of all, Cecilia Farfan Mendez. She's a postdoc fellow at, at uh, the Center for U.S.-Mexican Studies at UCSD. Uh, thank you, Cecilia. I mean, mission accomplished. We're here. I mean, she was the academic coordinator. Thank you, Ceci. Uh, Gema Santamaria is here. Gema and Cecilia, I will say, they're one of those uh, new Mexican young uh, scholars who are doing, I would say, literally uh, a wonderful uh, research on violent issues, and, and your work is so necessary for Mexico and for Latin America to overcome the crisis. Thank you for being here. And also, uh, Eric Olson is also here, as well as uh, Enrique Bravo, uh, my former student, and, uh, and Lori Smolensky. Thank you for being here. If I'm forgetting someone from the task force, I'm sorry, but those are, those are the ones who have who I have recognized. I want to thank my dean, my boss, Peter Kawi, for being here. Uh, this is important for us uh, at the School of Global Policy and Strategy. We're celebrating our 30th anniversary. I see this event as part of our celebration. What we're doing at GPS is basically trying to, to come up with a inno innovative solutions to world problems. I see... Uh, Security in Mexico, security in Latin America, security across the border were a problem, and I'm very grateful for my colleagues at GPS to help us put together this, uh, this paper and this task force. Let me make uh, four points to summarize the report. Uh, first of all, I will say it's, um, yes, Mexico and the U.S. were living critical times. Uh, Mexico is undergoing a violent crisis, and, uh, and the U.S., and I'm sure my, my colleague Tony Wayne will be talking about the opioid crisis in the U.S., and it's very telling. Martha, I was uh, just uh, telling and, and thank you, thanking you, but I was uh, saying that you're a diplomat who had, who had always been very close to academics, that you were a wonderful professor in international relations, and I wanted to... Uh, uh, to let you know, at the outset of your staying in Washington, I, I mean, we can tell you're doing wonderful. Uh, uh, you're a well-rounded diplomat. But eventually, uh, after six years here, remember that there is a center 
the Center of U.S. Mexican Studies, <laughs> and you can always come to write your book there. <laughs> that is my message to you, really, at the outset of, of, of your ambassadorship here in Washington. You, you've been there already, so you know that you're welcome there. So let me go back. My first point is, yes, we live in a crisis, and this crisis in Mexico and the U.S. has already compromised uh, the expectancy of living in both countries. So this, this could give you a sense of the magnitude of the crisis. So we're, we're undergoing this tremendous crisis, both in Mexico and in the U.S. Uh, it, yes, last year has been the most uh, violent year ever in Mexico, 33,000 uh, homicides. But what I want to say, and Ambassador Barsen already said something about it, it is, I mean, violence in Mexico and in Latin America, in Latin America is beyond homicides. What, what is really affecting us, Latin American, is street crime. And there's a lot of robberies in Mexico, so we really have to, to tackle these problems. And it's, so we're living chronic violence that, that goes beyond homicides. Let me make two points about violence in Mexico. First of all, Mexico is not alone. What we live in is a, is a regional crisis. Latin America has become the single most violent re region on Earth. We Latin Americans represent about 8% of the world's population, and we're concentrated about 33% of world homicide. This is too much. We, we must do something about this, and we must understand that this is, again, a, a regional crisis. Second, violence is multidimensional, and usually politicos, policymakers, they tend to emphasize the role uh, of drugs, of drug trafficking. Yes, this is very important, but I, were, but I would like to emphasize something that is common in Latin America and is the lack of, of state capacities. Uh, this is very keen. Uh, without state capacities, we, 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 without better police, without better prosecutors, without better judges, and without better prisons, we will not be able to reduce impunity, which is something that is badly needed in our countries, in our societies. Let me go to my second point. We all know that President Trump and President Lopez Obrador, they embody change. I mean, they, they, they are here basically to challenge the status quo. Well, the members of the task force, we believe very strongly that we must take into consideration the, the improvements of U.S.-Mexico security cooperation of the last two decades. Uh, we shouldn't reinvent the wheel. It's not about that. We, we should, I mean, uh, Ambassador Marta Barsen has already talked about the Merida Initiative. You're right. I believe it's about strengthening the Merida Initiative, not about destroying it. Merida Initiative now is only a fraction of what it was 12 years ago when, when it, it started. But I believe that Merida is very important because already has, ha, it has institutionalized some processes within the U.S. Congress, and it has really helped tremendously the dialogue and the communication between the two federal governments. Not only that, lately, the Merida Initiative has very, very good to, to come up with very innovative programs to state and local governments in Mexico. So that's key, and, and we must, I would say, strengthen that. My third point will be try to align the goals between Mexico and the U.S. security-wise. In the U.S., traditionally, it has been too much about drug interdiction and, and too much about drug, uh, drug kingpin strategy. I believe, and, and Marta Barsen has said so, in Mexico, it must be about citizen security. It's about our children walking to school. I mean... When I'm in San Diego, because now I live in San Diego, believe me, every day when I see these kids walking to school, I feel like, wow, I wish that could be happening in my city, in Mexico City. And uh, so that song is about citizen security. It's about reducing the levels of impunity. And, uh, and we must say that. And I'm glad that finally Andres Manuel López Obrador, the president, and, uh, and of course, her top diplomat in Washington, they have this uh, clarity of mind, and they understand that it's about the safety of Mexicans, about being able to play at, in the street as, as we used to play in the street. My children were able to play in the, in the street, but uh, not lately, <laughs> not anymore, I would put it that way. So it is very important. Uh, 
In the paper, we have nine very concrete uh, um, recommendations. Let me share with you two of them. First of all, we believe that it will be very important to have once again, uh, or to create a high-level group on security, a bilateral group on security affairs. Uh, let me share with you, working for President Calderon in 2009, uh, Janet Napolitano, newly Homeland Security Secretary, came to Mexico February 2009, and the late Carlos Rico, a wonderful policymaker, Marta knew him very well, he came with an idea of, of creating a, a working group on immigration issues. Janet Napolitano said yes, then Hillary Clinton, then Secretary of State said yes, and then Barack Obama or his White House said no because they, they thought it was too political. I'll tell you something. I believe if we had, if we were, had created that uh, by national group group on immigration, I will say we would not be living the crisis we're living in the U.S.-Mexico border, uh, especially the humanitarian crisis we live in there. The suffering of the immigrant community, particularly Mexicans and Central Americans, has been devastating for the last 12 to 15 years. This is too much, and what we need is to strengthen the dialogue. I believe that in this uh, uh, U.S.-Mexico working group, the role of the ambassadors is going to be key. Finally, we're going to have a U.S. ambassador to Mexico. He was finally nominated after nine months without an ambassador, so he's, he's welcome, I hope. The Senate will, will uh, shortly confirm here him, but this is important. And I believe that the participation of the foreign ministry will be key because we're talking about a regional crisis, so that's why the, the foreign ministry should be present in that discussion. My other point about this uh, uh, working group, I believe that even though Mexico is in the midst of a crisis, I believe that the Lopez Obrador team should come soon with a roadmap about for the next six years in terms of cooperating with the U.S., mm -hmm. I believe that the former uh, administration of Peña Nieto, they were, never, they were never able to come up with, an, with, a, with a full strategy on how to cooperate with the U.S., and this is important. Let me go to my, my closing point, and this is about, I will, I will say, we have to have a sense of urgency in creating this developing plan for Central America. I know this is a top priority for President López Obrador, but I will add to that a good security component. We could not have development in Central America without security, so security and development will go hand in hand. This will be very, very important. So it's, uh, I believe that López Obrador and I believe that the Trump White House, they should be very ambitious of this. We should be talking about a sort of a Marshall Plan for Central America. And I believe that the NGO community and also, I will say, the diasporas here, the Central Americans living here, the wealthy Mexican Americans, we should invite them to participate in, in this. They will be very key about helping their homelands to be more secure and to be, I will say, uh, and, uh, more developed. I will stop here. Thank you, Vanda. Thank you. Do you want to go to the podium? Okay. Well, getting to follow up uh, two excellent presentations, let me just focus a little bit on the recommendations at the end. And I do strongly recommend you take a look at the report. And uh, it, there's a lot of, of combined wisdom from both sides of the border in this report. So first, I, I agree fully that, one, that the, the first recommendation is key. It's very important that we have strategic alignment. As the ambassador said, we have different priorities. That's okay. But within those priorities, there's overlap. And we need to forge that agenda and agree on it and then have a way to follow up progress in getting all the agencies together to work on this agenda. One of the good reasons to have such a big group is we do have so many agencies on both sides of the border working on this. They do not have the same agendas. That's just a fact. It's a fact of bureaucracy. You need to be able to bring them together. They have to regularly be uh, held accountable to report what have they been doing here and there and how does this fit the overall agenda. 
So this whole process of having a group, having, uh, first aligning the strategies, to having a group to monitor that, periodically getting together to see how everybody's working together is really important. Historically, in my experience, we never fully had that in the, in the years that I saw. We got closer. We established a group in 2013, 2014 that brought everybody together for the first time ever. We hadn't done that before, but there's more we can do. So this is an opportunity to do that. Secondly, clearly the National Guard is the innovation going on now. So, and, and it's not only establishing the National Guard, it is recruiting members, it is training them, it is properly providing the capacitation equipment they need. There's a lot that can be done bilaterally that has traditionally fallen in the area of the Merida program, whatever we end up calling it. That can be a very important part of collaboration between the two countries as this goes forward. Secondly, in, that, in the second point we get to, we talk about subnational governance. One of the very sad legacies of all our efforts to cooperate is we have not focused enough on subnational law enforcement authorities. Um, there were several areas, a couple of, pro of states in Mexico, where we did work closely with them under the Merida program and that produced good results. But there are other places that are now suffering from a lot of violence where we just never did work. There are a lot of reasons for that, but it is very important that our dialogue include talking about, as the ambassador said, as, she, as they go ahead trying to re-establish security, they're going to start looking at state and local police forces. I think there's a lot of area that we can help each other in that, in that collaboration. Um, Mexico uh, needs to get better at prevention, as the ambassador said. It also needs to get a lot better at investig investigation and prosecution, as she also did say. And so addressing that, all of these is going to be very important for restoring that sense of security. And there's a lot that we can do together in that area, but there's a lot that we haven't been able to do because of the shortcomings in the investigative capacities and the prose prosecution capacities. In a number of cases, it was largely the United States that did most of the investigation and then prosecution in a certain category of crimes. We want a partnership where that's not the case, where we're each taking many cases forward to bring justice to them. And so this does have to be an important area, I think, of work together in justice reform and improving that capacity um, in the Mexican system. And I'm a strong believer in having joint investigations for processes that touch across the border, that that actually forces people to work together, um, hopefully, we would create a trusted environment to do that. That's one of the important recommendations also is to have vetting for people. <clears throat> but that's actually a way to learn together and to help bring people to justice. And I think we need to do more of that as we move forward. Uh, another of the recommendations is to focus on fentanyl and other synthetic opioids. The reason for that, as uh, the ambassador alluded to this, uh, great growth in the trafficking of this. They're very lethal, and they're areas of gigantic profit for the drug cartels. They, it does not cost much to produce them. Much cheaper to produce fentanyl and put it in pills than to raise poppies and turn it into heroin, and a lot easier to get across the border or to mail into the United States or to get across the Canadian border. And so... I think one of the things we have to do is coordinate between the three countries of North America and deal with China together because most of this right now is coming from China. Eventually it might come from India or other places. So you do need to go after the, the organized trafficking groups in order to prevent that. But there's a lot we can do uh, both bilaterally, trilaterally, and quadrilaterally to deal with this problem. Um, Similarly, the demand side, as was mentioned, is really important. We do have to have a dialogue about that. Another recommendation is look at community policing. Um, this is an area, uh, John Feel is here in the office, and I still remember when I first got to Mexico, he was the deputy chief of mission and had been charge, and he said, Tony, well, no, 
that we've had success with the Meritor program when a 12-year-old girl gets lost in the crowd and runs up to a policeman and asks for help. She would not do that right now. Now, you're going to do that if you have community policing and people trust the police in their communities. So, see, John, I did listen to things you were telling me. <laughs> corruption. Uh, corruption is it's a big deal in bilateral cooperation. Um, a lot of, of, of work that we do takes place only between people that we can trust, and that means there is l very limited areas for actually joint work together. So the vetting, again, is very important um, in order to have that trust, and this is true between Mexican agencies as well, not just U.S.-Mexico. It's going to be really important. Having more transparent and automated processes so that targeting of potential criminal operations is, does not filter through officials that might be tainted and might redirect that targeting other places using bigger databases, uh, search of those databases with automated processes, a lot that can be done in that area to improve transparency and limit corruption. Um, and finally, money laundering. Uh, the, the estimates from DEA are $18, $20 billion a year made by drug groups from Mexico selling drugs in the United States. That's a lot of money. We find in a good year maybe a billion dollars worth of that. It's out there somewhere. We've got to get better at cutting off that money that supplies the drug groups, that buys arms in the United States, that buys officials, that buys all, you know, all sorts of other things. And we didn't do that. We haven't done that yet. We can take this to a whole different level, I think, of cooperation. I am a big fan, again, of having joint investigative efforts that focus on cross-border money laundering operations and even going through third countries, because there's a lot that does go through third countries. Let me stop there, and we can Great. From, um, thank you very much, you. Uh, Tony and Rafael, for the excellent review of the reports. I am mindful of time and uh, brooking strictness uh, in sticking to the timeline, so I will have to bite my tongue and not ask you each a ton of questions that I have in mind. But let me start by asking one question of each of you and then uh, opening it again uh, to all of you. Um, Tony, you have enormously distinguished uh, U.S. Uh, diplomatic career that very much focused and continues to focus on economic issues. In the early days of the Trump administration, many Mexican officials, who, when they came to town, um, highlighted the interconnection between security and trade issues. With um, a perhaps uh, somewhat of a subtext that security cooperation would also be a function of what happens within the negotiations of NAFTA and the U.S.-Mexican economic relationship more broadly. Are we still in that state? What is the interconnectedness today? And how is the security cooperation dependent on what happens with uh, the U.S.-Mexico-Canada uh, uh, agreement? Well, there are several different layers to respond to that question. So first, on the border itself, the two questions are intimately integrated. You're facilitating good things crossing the border, and you're stopping bad things from crossing the border. So you need a holistic approach to looking at trade facilitation and this, all the, the illicit smuggling that's going in both directions. And you need to get all the people working on the border or near the border to be thinking in those different ways because you want to do both things at the same time. Secondly, uh, when you're having a lot of really negative rhetoric at the political level between the two countries, it makes it harder to do sensitive mm -hmm. cooperation, especially that might be criticized at home. So there was that period of time... Um, when, let's say, a lot of negative things were being said from this side of the border about Mexico, it made it hard for my former colleagues in the law enforcement area in Mexico to really push ahead in cooperation with the United States. Now, we're not there now, uh, so that's good, and we don't want to return to that in, in that area. And then over the long run, uh, it 
having a, a vibrant trade and investment relationship um, encourages and often requires a good law enforcement and justice relationship in order for it to function. And I sincerely believe that the establishment of NAFTA um, had a big effect, had many big effects in Mexico, but one of them was it opened the door for much wider cooperation than would have been the case in the early 1990s or certainly in the 1980s. We just started collaborating in many more areas for the mutual benefit of both countries. So the, the whole economic partnership and the security partnership go along together, I think. Well, thank you. Um, Rafael, you spoke about um, San Diego and uh, kids on the street going to school. Um, of course, San Diego is a good host. Tijuana, wonderful city, amazing city, uh, really suffering from uh, criminal violence. Last year uh, was the Mexican city with the highest uh, murder rate, let alone other issues such as extortion. It's also the uh, key focus of uh, the Lopez Obrador administration uh, in the 17 areas, arguably it's number one area, and it has um, enjoyed uh, having the first National Guard deployment of 1,800 uh, personnel to be helping to reduce violence. Can you give us uh, your reflections, observations on Tijuana violence there? And also, of course, Tijuana is one of the emblematic um, uh, uh, cities or locations of migrants uh, from Central America staying in Tijuana waiting for their asylum cases to be heard. Yes, Vanda, not an easy question, uh, a complex answer, but uh, just let me say something about uh, NAFTA. I believe NAFTA had a lot of spillovers and, uh, and truly helped us Mexican and Americans to, to try to better cooperate on security affairs. And I believe we have done fairly well on security. We're, we're, we're still not yet. But on immigration issues, we're really not yet. Uh, we really have been... Uh, unilateralism continued to be the order of the day in migration issues. To me, that is a mistake. I understand that the soul of the U.S. is being discussed when you're talking about immigration reform. But still, I mean, we, we should have a, a strengthy dialogue because it's, uh, we badly need it. Let, let me go back to... Uh, I will say, you know, talking about the migrant caravan, uh, the migrant caravan was seen as, as a movement of people. I'm, I'm talking before the midterm election that could have devastating consequences for the U.S.-Mexico border. Uh, Ambassador Barcena came uh, to San Diego and Tijuana. We were together, and, 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 and your husband, Agustin, uh, Ambassador Agustin, Gutierrez Canet, and, uh, and basically, I mean, we saw the bilateral relations impending on Tijuana and San Diego. Do you know something? Tijuana and San Diego were, were, were act, act as a buffer zone. Uh, the caravan eventually was, was di diluted into Tijuana and into San Diego. I would say about one-third of the caravan people, they came into the U.S., and, uh, and some of them are waiting for asylum. Some of them are going to be deported back, but one-third is in, in San Diego. And I would say San Diego has this very active civil society, these wonderful NGOs, basically helping and pushing the local government to serve uh, migrants. On the other side of the border, I have never seen such a vibrant uh, NGOs, uh, organizations like in Tijuana, Ambassador was there. I mean, we were talking with these activists, a professional activists, wonderful people. So I will say about another third of the caravan, they stay in Tijuana. Mostly, I would say, young Central Americans, they are already working in the construction industry. There's a boom in Tijuana in the construction industry. And I would say about one third have been going back to Central America. So, I mean, it was diluted. It was some, some of the caravan has been integrated into Tijuana and into San Diego. The same happened, by the way, three years ago with the Haitians. We have about 70,000, mostly Hondurans, coming last fall into Tijuana and San Diego. But Haitians, we have 20,000 Haitians. And they've been absorbed and they were buffered by, by this uh, Tijuana and San Diego. But I would... Uh, I'm worried about uh, the coming up uh, of the increasing levels of violence in Tijuana. Yes, it's, it's, it's way too much. There's a big debate between the, I would say, business community in Tijuana because, indeed, the new violence in Tijuana, is, it, it is not the same that the one we had there in 2008, 2009. 
Then violence was in, main, was in Broadway. It was in Avenida Revolución in Zona Rio. It was affecting, uh, I would say, important businesses. It was affecting tourism in Tijuana. Now it's in the isolated neighborhoods, but still there's a lot of violence. So it seems to me, and, and, I'm, and I'm seeing from the central government that they're trying to come with this comprehensive approach because, yes, we have to combat corruption. We have to go to the root of the problem, and some of the root of the problem is, is poverty, is the, the terrible, uh, I would say, distribution of, of wealth we have in Tijuana, we have in the entire Mexico. And I would say, and it's about uh, putting together the, the local, the state, and the federal government. We have in elections in Baja California and Tijuana this coming June. It's going to be key. And I will say the number one issue for the election is security, and I hope the new, the incoming governors will address it. We're, we're going to have a conference uh, at, at our center very soon on that, about violence in Tijuana, about the issues of the election, because I do believe this coming election is paramount for the well-being of the region and for the well-being of the entire border, because Tijuana and San Diego, let's face it, we are setting the example for the rest of the world. Let me stop here. But. Well, thank you. I'll take um, three questions and uh, turn it over to the panel. So this uh, lady right here, please wait for the microphone, introduce yourself, and ask a brief question. Thank you. Um, I'm the congressional correspondent for the Hispanic Outlook. Um, it seems like that there isn't much incentive for Mexico to keep uh, caravans and such in Mexico that they that they are a fairly good idea that they would encourage them to come through the United States. So, how what kind of incentive can be given to Mexico to you know, support uh, border security on the southern border? And in that uh, phase, also, what is being done with the UNHCR establishing refugee camps on the southern border of Mexico? Thank you. I'll take all the questions first. Yeah, I'll take them all. Uh, the gentleman uh, uh, in the blue shirt in the back. Uh, thank you very much. Whenever I go to Mexico and talk with friends and family about the dual problem of crime and corruption, one point that comes up frequently is uh, at a local level the collusion between politicians, police, and organized crime. Now, most of what I heard this afternoon seems to suggest measures that from the top down, uh, and I would like to ask what are the initiatives to break this unholy alliance between crime, politicians, and uh, drug trafficking and impunity at a local level in Mexico? Thank you. And the last question, the gentleman right behind. Uh, the ambassador first talked about adding thousands of new people into the National Guard and police. Uh, Mr. Fernandez de Castro talked about lack of administrative capacity. Doesn't this seem to provide a great opportunity for the criminal elements, the gangs and the cartels, to totally infiltrate these new law enforcement uh, entities? Thank you. Tony, Rafael, whichever order, whichever questions you would like to take. You tell us. All right, you? let me start at the end. Uh, yes, there has to be a very careful election selection process for bringing people into the National Guard. One of the big challenges over recent years in Mexico has been precisely imperfect methods for screening people coming in at various levels at the federal, for federal institutions, for state institutions, and, and even much worse at, at the municipal level. Um, so that does have to be a very important part of this whole process because you were right. Uh, for example, one of the things that used to be the case was somebody could be kicked out of one police force, one state force, just go to another state and get hired again because they had the skills. And you didn't, that state did not know that they'd been kicked out for corruption or ties to a criminal gang. So that's one of the values of having a national system and a database for actually selecting the people that, that come in. At local level, you're exactly right. It does need to be tackled there, but I think you need to ask the, unless, Rafael, unless you have some idea, you have to ask the government of Mexico how they're going to start <laughs> tackling that. 
you know, one, we have to be, we do have to be understanding. The government of Mexico inherited a horrible situation when they came to power. If you just just look at the numbers of homicides, you'll see that they, from 2014 on, they've shot up. They set n- historic records, 2017, historic records in 2018, and the first two months of 2019 have been historic records for January and February since they started collecting this data in 1997. So this is a really difficult situation. All sorts of things need to be fixed. They're not going to be able to fix everything right away, but you are certainly right. You've got to break this partnership at every level you can, you can break it. Uh, I would say that uh, why caravans? Well, there's caravans because of uh, there's way too many abuses against migrants in transit in Mexico. Uh, uh, we've, been, we've been neglected, uh, the uh, migrants in transit, for the last 10 or 20 years or so. So they have to come in big numbers uh, to protect themselves. Uh, but they are, they are also politically mo- mo- motivated. I mean, some of the movements are politically motivated. In, in South America, in Honduras, for example, the, the Honduras caravan was motivated as a, a, a criticism uh, to the, the president of Honduras, who had a dubious election. And uh, but I would say the response from Mexico should be uh, to prioritize, I mean, the, the protection of, 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 of uh, migrants in transit. Uh, we haven't been able to do that. And it uh, seems to me that now, at least from the interior ministry, we're seeing a more humanitarian approach. Uh, everybody's talking about that, and I'm glad. Now it seems, I'm sorry to say this, but uh, now the foreign ministry, is becoming like the hawk of the, because they worried about having so many migrants coming into the northern border. I mean, it, it, it could create us problems there. But I will say this is, uh, I mean, the, the only solution is to go to the root of the problem. So therefore, uh, the idea of having this uh, development plan for Central America and Southern Mexico is key. Uh, I could, I, I mean, I, this is, a top priority, priority for López Obrador, and I hope he will deliver, because this is not easy to do. It's, it's very complicated, and it will need a lot of political will from him, and a lot of his capital, political capital, and believe me, he has a lot. So I believe he can deliver if he decided to do this. It will really have to become his number one foreign policy priority for this to happen. Just to add, I agree fully that the, the medium and long-term solution is in southern Mexico and northern Central America. But we don't live in the medium and long-term. That's why the Foreign Ministry of Mexico correctly is worried about what's going to happen at the northern border. And they don't have all the solutions, I understand that. But you cannot, you have a very dangerous situation with these thousands of people coming up, and this is the situation that we live in. And so... The ambassador, all her colleagues, they're going to have to deal with this. You need to find short-term solutions to be able to get to that medium and long-term, which is going to take a lot of work. That is correct. But it's the short-term that's that's very important to manage well to avoid the bad outcomes that are possible. Rafael, here is an opportunity for another excellent, diligent work on another task force and white paper. Be our guest, Vanda. We need people. You, we need uh, team leaders, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, yes, we, we should really be talking about that. Yeah. Uh, Ambassador Wayne, uh, Dr. Fernandez de Castro, thank you very much uh, for joining us today for your thank remarks. You. Uh, Ambassador Barcena, we are very grateful uh, for uh, your coming here today and enlightening us, and thank you uh, all for participating and asking questions. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.